Take a second and think about your mom. You probably just smiled a little now. Everyone's mom is their life's single-handed superhero. Countless pieces of song, film and poetry have been dedicated to moms. It's a relationship like no other and all dads seem to know that they come a close second. So what happens when that very same mom, the one you take or fire a bullet for, spirals down into a path of sinister crime and decides to take you along with her? This is the story of one such mother whose life of crime and lack of remorse turned her two daughters into the most infamous criminals the country had ever seen. This is the story of the Gavit sisters. Hi everyone, welcome to Desi Crime, a show where we deep dive into some of the craziest cases from around South Asia. I'm your host Ashwarya and I'm Aryan. And the case I have for you today is a harrowing one with not one crime, not two crimes either, but more than 100. See, 100 crimes is mm-hmm. a lot of crimes to a lot begin of crimes, with. Yeah. But there is something sinister mm-hmm. about a sister duo being at the yeah. center of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think again like a mom and daughter relationship, yeah. it's kind of a pure relationship, but yeah. All right, take us through the story of these sisters. Let's go. So we're beginning this case in 1990 at the Chatur Shringi Temple in Pune. This day was like any other at the temple with lots of devotees coming to offer their daily prayers with their families and friends. In the crowd that day was a woman named Renuka Shinde with her toddler son. You see Renuka had just gotten married a year ago to a man named Kiran Shinde who was a tailor in Pune and with him she had recently had a beautiful baby boy. If you were in the temple crowd that day nothing about Renuka or her little baby boy would stand out to you. She seemed like any ordinary woman that afternoon. As the daily prayers went on and Renuka made her way through the crowd at the temple she noticed a woman holding a handbag. Renuka saw an opportunity. In her mind there were too many people in this crowd for her to get caught. She could snatch that handbag and make a run for it rather easily. Only when she did that she realized that multiple people in the crowd saw her. The woman to whom the bag belonged screamed and the crowd grabbed Renuka and refused to let her leave. By this point Renuka had also dropped the bag and began claiming she wasn't the one who snatched the bag to begin with. The crowd still seemed hesitant to believe her though when Renuka said something that got everyone to let her go scot free. I'm a woman with a child. How could I steal? Everyone looked at her, looked at her little baby and realized that they probably made a big mistake by holding a mother like this. And so they let her go. Now for any ordinary person getting caught while committing petty theft and getting caught with a baby nonetheless would scare them. If you were Renuka walking back from the temple as the angry mob had shown you mercy, you would probably think of how you need to stop committing these crimes before you actually get caught or you at least need to be way more careful when you do commit them. What Renuka was thinking on her way back from the temple though was none of that. She had just realized that having a young child with you while you commit a crime makes you less likely to be caught because nobody expects a mother with a baby to steal and run. This discovery struck Renuka like a lightning bolt and she made her way straight to her mother and her sister to tell them about it. You know, I could totally see a world where mm-hmm. uh, you know, a woman mm-hmm. uh, upon coming across exciting news yeah. goes back to her house yeah. and tells her mother and her sister, "Look, there is a sale at uh, Lululemon." Whatever, yeah. Right, wh- whatever. <laughs> yeah. But to come back home with the epiphany of a I've crime just landed tactic. on a crime tactic, guys, yeah. that you, mm-hmm. you just can't believe. Yeah. That's a little that's off. And as we go along in this case you'll realize there was very little that was ordinary about oh, okay. this trio the the two sisters and the mom <laughs> okay. this is just the beginning of it 
Now to understand why Renuka ever felt okay telling her mother and sister about this realization, we have to go back in time, way back in time to 1973 when Renuka was just a toddler herself. In 1973, a woman named Anjana Bai was living in Pune with a man she crazily loved. In fact, their love was so passionate that they had run away together from Nasik and settled in Pune, ignoring the disapproval of their families and leaving behind everyone they knew. Soon after that, the two got married and shortly after, Anjana Bai found herself pregnant with her first child, a baby girl named Renuka. Anjana Bai's husband's job as a truck driver wasn't incredible, but it seemed enough to sustain their new family. While not many details are available about the man Anjana Bai was married to, we do know that slowly over time, their once passionate love fizzled. The responsibilities of daily life caught up and before Anjana Bai knew it, her husband had walked out on her and her child, never to return again. Soon, for Anjana Bai, there remained no way to feed herself and the young child she now had to care for. To steal seemed like the only way out. And so began a life of crime. But at the start, her crimes were rather small. She would go to railway stations, melas, temples and any other regularly crowded place she could find. There, she would pull wallets out of people's pockets, snatch purses, steal watches from wrists and grab whatever she could lay her hands on. While she continued to live a life of crime to survive, somewhere in the backdrop, she was also falling in love again, this time to a man named Mohan Gavit. Mohan Gavit was once a hard-working man, a retired soldier who by 1975 was surviving only on his pension. When he met Anjana Bai in 1975 itself, the two fell madly in love. In fact, the fact that Anjana Bai already had a daughter with another man or that she had already been married once didn't stop Mohan from marrying Anjana Bai, which was a significant step for a man back in the 1970s. Not only did he marry Anjana Bai though, he also accepted Renuka with open arms. In fact, even though the couple went on to have a daughter of their own, Seema Gavit, Mohan and Anjana Bai continued to love Renuka just the same. Tell me this, uh, did he know her story of crime and her life of crime? Not yet, not, not yet. quite in the beginning, but all of that is about What did he think she used to do for a living? I think it's normal for a woman to not do anything. Uh, okay, she was married yeah, once, yeah. she had some money from there, 1970s, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, adds up. But if love was the only ingredient needed for a successful love story and a successful marriage, we would have a lot more happy couples around us than we actually do. Anjana Bai and Mohan had one significant point of contention, money. To Anjana Bai, Mohan's pension wasn't enough to sustain even just the two of them, much less their two growing daughters who needed to be educated and fed. But by this point in her life, Anjana Bai had a tried and tested solution to the problem of money, theft. And by this point in their marriage, a few years down the line, Mohan did know about his wife's life of petty crime. Very often, Anjana Bai would find herself getting caught by crowds of people in the middle of committing an act of theft, after which the police would take her with them and Mohan would have to come and save her. He would have to beg and plead and apologize to police officers more times than he could remember. And with every passing act of crime, the rift between the couple worsened. I don't get how you can be caught by the police multiple times yeah. and to not like be on the th thieves most wanted. Like how does the police just let you go when you are a repeated offender? I think just traveling around a lot, ah, okay, like okay, going okay. to different melas, just going to a different whatever okay. district, hmm. one different day, multiple different temples, different jurisdictions, all of that. But yeah, it is kind of weird. She never got she caught. She was a professional <laughs> kleptomaniac. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Anjana Bai was stripping Mohan of his most prized possession, his dignity. Mohan wasn't a wealthy man, but he was a proud man. And to love a woman like Anjana Bai seemed like a constant uphill battle that was wearing him down. It was in this phase of the couple's life that a different woman entered the picture. A beautiful woman named Pratibha. To love Pratibha was easy, uncomplicated and fulfilling. When Anjana Bai was breaking Mohan apart, Pratibha was helping him heal. And so Mohan didn't think it would come as a huge surprise when he ultimately decided to divorce Anjana Bai and start a life with Pratibha instead. But to Anjana Bai, this was betrayal like she had never known before. And that day, the day Mohan left, something about Anjana Bai changed for the worse. After Mohan left, Anjana Bai took both her daughters and began to teach them the life of crime she had always known. So 
they were stepsisters, right? Step because sisters. their dad yeah. was different. Dad the same. And Mohan didn't take uh, Renuka is his stepdaughter, but yeah. he didn't take his biological no, daughter. No, he did with, not. Okay. They both remained with Anjana hmm. Bai. Her elder daughter would help her steal from crowded locations and her younger daughter would act as bait or distraction when necessary. While the women continued their journey of crime, Anjana Bai's eldest daughter, Renuka, went on to get married and have a baby of her own, a baby named Ashish. But Renuka's marriage mirrored the marriage of her mother. Her husband abandoned her shortly after she had her child. Then in 1983, Renuka met a man named Kiran Shinde and fell madly in love with him, just like her mother had with Mohan. The two then went on to get married in 1989 with Kiran accepting Renuka's son from her previous marriage, just like Mohan had accepted her. But unlike Mohan, Kiran Shinde became Renuka's accomplice in all of her crimes, helping her, Anjana Bai and Seema whenever it was necessary. It was almost like their shared affinity to commit crimes brought them even closer together. So this is like a all female run small business, you know, uh, yeah, small business. Yeah. Absolutely. I yeah. think if you replace with a on the side. if you replace theft with anything, anything else, else it's really this empowering. Be, this is so empowering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But just that one tiny detail. Yeah, how they make the money. But make no mistake, the point of all of this crime wasn't just to survive. In the back of Anjana Bai's mind, Mohan's betrayal played every night and the need for revenge had captured her. She didn't yet know how her revenge would take shape yet. She just knew she wanted it. And the method of Anjana Bai's revenge was hitting her daughter Renuka like a lightning bolt when she was walking back from a temple after almost getting caught. When Renuka ran to her mother and sister to tell them the story of what happened to her at the temple, to tell them about how she was let go by an angry crowd only because she had her son Ashish with her, the three women felt like they had just struck gold. The plan from here on was going to be simple. They were going to kidnap children all below the age of 5 and take those children with them to temples, melas, railway stations and they were going to steal as usual. Only now if they were to get caught, they would use the kidnapped kid either as an excuse or as a distraction to run away. Eventually, the trio were going to kidnap Mohan and Pratibha's daughter and Pratibha too, mm. all in an attempt to get back at Mohan for leaving Anjana Bai. In all of this, Renuka's husband Kiran was going to act as their getaway man, keeping a bike ready to take the women away once they were done stealing. Initially, when the women began kidnapping little kids, they would simply let the kids go once they had been used to steal for a few months. Whether or not those kids ever made it back home, nobody knows because all of these kidnapped kids came from very poor families with not enough resources to look for the missing kids. Do we know how they were going about kidnapping kids? Yes, again, in really really crowded locations, just picking up kids and running away, which is why I think the point of these kids being younger than 5 years old makes so much sense mm. is because it's much easier to lure or like grab the hand of a 5 year old yeah, and take them sense. away without them wanting mm-hmm. to look for their parents. But then in 1991 in the middle of a theft the women attempted to commit their first ever act of murder inside a temple around a crowd of hundreds of people In April of 1991 Seema and Anjana Bai decided to take one of the kidnapped boys one year old Santosh to the Mahalakshmi temple in Kolhapur Maharashtra to steal from the crowd of devotees there This little boy had been kidnapped by the women almost a year ago in July of 1990 and the women actually had no idea what his real name was Santosh was just a random name the women had chosen to give the boy But when Seema took Santosh to the temple and tried to steal a handbag from a woman's arm, she got caught. The crowd noticed and began to surround Seema. Anjana Bai, standing in the back of the crowd, holding Santosh in her arms, noticed things going south and knew she had to intervene to save her daughter. In a split-second decision to divert attention from Seema, Anjana Bai threw one-year-old Santosh down on the ground with so much force that Santosh ended up breaking the bones in both his knees. The crowd utterly perplexed at a baby falling like this completely forgot about the stolen handbag and gathered around Anjana Bai and Santosh instead. From here Seema and Anjana Bai both managed to escape with Kiran and a crying Santosh. The same day the women tried to take Santosh to a bus stand to steal from the bus passengers but the baby wouldn't stop crying. This was a problem for the women. The baby just wouldn't stop crying because of how injured he was now. The bleeding crying child was a problem for the women and they knew they needed to get rid of him. 
To kill him, the women bashed Santosh's head on an electric pole from their moving mm-hmm. vehicle. That's not it, Aryan. And then stopped on a roadside to eat vada pav, which multiple witnesses have confirmed. Jesus, dude. Yeah. When Santosh's body was discovered near a rickshaw stand the next day, the police had no idea who the kid was and just did nothing. While records of who the other children were or how they were used by the women isn't available, official reports state that the women kidnapped a total of 13 children and killed 10 of them brutally. This is the same problem that arose in the Nithari case mm-hmm. where because they were mostly poor children yeah the police didn't know how many were you know it yeah. was it was only those families that could afford to go to the police right. and put up with the process so that i think the number yeah, so number i think it's is like always number higher. is always yeah. higher than yeah. what it was yeah one of those kids died from being thrown down the stairs while another was killed after being hit repeatedly reports say that one 2 year old boy was killed after he was hung upside down from the ceiling in anjana bai's home and was swung with so much force that his head slammed against the wall multiple times a different 2 year old a girl was killed by being brutally beaten up after which the women stuffed the girl's body in a duffel bag carried it along with them to a movie hall to watch a full movie with the dead body and then dumped the dead body in an isolated location somewhere along the way anjana bai and her daughters had gone from being petty criminals or even kidnappers only trying to survive to sadistic murderers who gained satisfaction and joy from brutally torturing and killing children Earlier in their criminal journey it was easy to sympathize with them Anjana Bai was a young woman left out in the world to fend for herself and she did the best she could but at some point she crossed over the line of a victim and turned into India's most brutal killer and after 6 years of kidnapping and stealing and killing it was time for the women to hit big it was time for revenge by 1996 Mohan and Prathiba had had two kids of their own It was their older child, their 9-year-old daughter Kranti, that Anjana Bai had her eyes on. She yearned to kidnap Kranti and torture her to keep her away from her parents, only so Mohan and Pratibha would feel what she felt all of those years ago. And so the women put their plan in motion. They observed Mohan's life closely for days and found their routine, after which they caught Kranti when she was unsupervised. The plan was to kidnap Pratibha, the mom, Mohan's wife and their younger child too, but the trio weren't successful. But to them Kranti was a start. The plan was for the women and Kiran to go underground as soon as they kidnapped Kranti because unlike other victims parents, Mohan and Pratibha were going to go to the police. And so after kidnapping Kranti, all four of the perpetrators just disappeared. As soon as Kranti went missing Pratibha's motherly senses took over. She had heard of Anjana Bai's stories from her husband and a part of her just knew that it was those women who took away her daughter. Mohan and Kranti didn't wait to report their daughter missing to the police and the police acted swiftly too. When the couple told the police that they knew about the three women, the police pulled every string to track down Anjana Bai's home. While none of the four killers were found in the house, the walls of the house told the tales of many murdered children. Inside the house, the Kolhapur police found many clothes belonging to children, lots of photographs of children, the traces of blood in parts of the home. The police knew they weren't dealing with just petty thieves, and so they placed plain-clothed officers outside the Gavit household waiting for the women to resurface. and resurface they did their obsession with revenge caught them out of their hole kidnapping kranti wasn't enough for them they had resurfaced to kidnap pratibha and the couple's younger child but the moment they did the police took note and caught all four of them the crime investigation department put some of their best officers on the case who began from the start and consolidated proof against the four in as many crimes as they could By the time the CID investigation ended they had 156 witnesses all detailing different parts of different crimes committed by the women Please tell me they found Kranti They did find Kranti dead or alive I will get to in just a minute All right all right But to think that all of this hard work on part of the police would bring justice to all of those murdered kids would be a mistake In a blow to the case Anjana Bai died in 1997 less no. than a year after the four were caught Added to that was the fact that despite all of these witnesses the four criminals did not break for almost a year they did not reveal where Kranti was and what they had done with her 
All of that changed, however, when one of the remaining three agreed to become a witness for the state in exchange for protection. And that one person was Kiran. Kiran. It seemed like all of the love and enthusiasm he had once shown his wife's plans was out of the window now when the prospect of the death penalty faced the three. Kiran revealed to the police the women's game plan and the role he played in it, the brutality of their murders and their final plan for revenge. When Seema realized Kiran had broken in exchange for protection, she broke too. She told the police what they had done with Kranti. They had killed her by repeatedly beating her and then throwing her body out in a sugarcane field. It seemed like Kranti was different from the other kids. The plan was never to use her for theft and the plan was also never to let her go eventually. It was always to murder her. This is also indicative in the fact that Kranti was much older than any of the other kids the women had kidnapped. Kranti was always meant to be killed for revenge. Which gives you a hint into the fact that maybe the women were always murderers. While Mohan and Pratibha's life had been shattered forever, the rest of the country breathed a sigh of relief that the women had been arrested. Soon, the charges against the two women were brought in court. 13 counts of kidnapping and wrongful confinement and 10 counts of murder. By 2001, the Sessions Court had found both women guilty on all counts of kidnapping and wrongful confinement, but only six counts of murder. Those six murders, however, would be enough to seal their fate. By 2006, the Supreme Court of India confirmed the death sentence for the two sisters. But when has a case ever really ended this easily? You see, Seema and Renuka Gavit are still very much alive, living in the high-security Yerwara jail in Pune. How, I'm glad you asked, after the death sentence was confirmed by the Supreme Court, both women went on to file mercy petitions in 2008 and 2009. In 2013, the governor of Maharashtra rejected the pleas and in 2014, President Pranam Mukherjee rejected the plea too. But that was a total of five years that the government took to reject the plea, when usually it takes the government usually three months to do the same. Such a long wait time to accept or deny a mercy petition is said to have a severely dehumanizing effect on the convicts, making them live in constant fear of their death. Yeah, in this case, it was justified. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, was justified. This is one of those cases where, yeah, sure. But also, it's the rule of law. No, I know, I, know, I get I, the rule of law, yeah. but oh no, don't, I'm just so afraid of what yeah, you're going to say I now. know, I'm afraid of saying it, but. Go ahead. That is exactly what the two women claimed happened to them, that they were living in constant fear because of the government's delay. As much as the government and people may have wanted to hang the women, the delay of justice was a miscarriage of justice. And so, in January of 2022, the High Court changed their death sentence to life imprisonment. In a strong statement against the women, the court called them, quote, a menace to society and assured the public that the women would spend the rest of their lives behind bars. The most haunting part about this case and about these serial killers to me isn't even the nature or amount of murders they committed. It's their lack of remorse for any of it. Countless reporters and journalists who have interviewed the women point to that exact thing. The women seem confident, cocky even, bashful of their reasons and incapable of comprehending the loss and grief they've caused. Very few times in its history has India seen murderers like that. For that reason, today and probably forever, Anjana Bai, Renuka and Seema Gavit will be remembered as the most notorious serial killers the country had ever seen. If you like what we do here at AC Studios and absolutely love what we're wearing today, this is merch you can go buy all for yourself. You can buy this Desi Crime merch in our YouTube store on the link down below at Karak Merch. Keep the engines at Desi Studios rolling so we can pay our videographer right behind the camera to make these amazing episodes just for you.